Um, okay, well, first, let me just say welcome to everyone who is coming in. Sorry, we were just having some technical difficulties, but I assume everyone's gotten used to the Zoom-tastic uh, nature of our, um, <laughs> of our lives right now. So my name's uh, Amy Woodson-Bolton. We still have folks coming in. Welcome, welcome. Um, we are uh, just getting sorted out. Um, you have, if you were here for coups, coronations, and crowds, you're in the right place. We are here to talk about um, transitions of power through history. Um, and I uh, will, um, so just so everyone knows who is here and for our panelists, our order will be uh, Professor Perrin and then Professor McDonald, and then Professor Robb, and then Professor Drummond, and then Professor Dempsey. Um, so my name is Amy Woodson Bolton, and I am a professor of modern Britain and Ireland. I am past chair of the history department, although I'm very happy that the person who is currently chair is Elizabeth Drummond, who is also joining us today. This is one of a series of events that we've been doing for the last several years called History in the Headlines, which is part of a broader uh, goal that we've had, which is really to put on programming that consistently um, expresses and um, shares our enthusiasm for history, but also the relevance and importance of history. Um, I think right now in our current political moment, in our current historical moment, with a pandemic raging, with insurrection at the Capitol last week, we have never before seen, um, I, uh, and kind of sadly to me, the relevance of history and historical perspective. So um, today we are gonna be hearing from a number uh, from our uh, experts here in the history department. They're gonna give brief examples, historical examples of transitions of power and kind of think of, as we think about what makes um, a, a transition legitimate, uh, what makes it illegitimate, when have people contested those, uh, those transitions. So our first speaker is Professor Anthony Perrin. He's our historian of medieval Europe. Um, I'm going to pop some uh, links in the chat uh, so you can look up further information about the history department and about our speakers. I'm also going to put in the chat a link to a really great compendium of, um, it's a great resource called Historians Contextualizing the Capital Insurrection. So those links will go in the chat um, as, as we start up here. Um, please put your questions in the Q&A. Um, so I am going to um, get us going. So. Um, Professor Perrin, can you start us off? And I've given everyone like five or six minutes. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, well, I'd like to thank all my colleagues for uh, for organizing this event and um, thank all of you for coming. It looks like there's a really good turnout, which is fantastic. Um, when we were first planning this event uh, a few weeks ago, um, I actually had proposed uh, that, that the title should be Transitions of Power, Always Complicated, Sometimes Bloody. Uh, at that time, of course, we we didn't know that our own transfer of power, the the, the occasion of this event, would would turn out to be so shockingly um, and sadly violent. Um, but when we were kind of thinking about this, uh, the immediate example that came to my mind um, from the Middle Ages that might bear on the question of regime change was one um, one of the most famous examples of of of. of a power transition in the pre-modern past, and one that uh, is 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 actually kind of notable for its lack of violence. And I'm talking here um, about the moment in the middle of the eighth century when a new dynasty, the dynasty of the Carolingians, seized uh, the crown of the Frankish kingdom, uh, which is roughly coterminous with France and Belgium today, uh, not quite, but 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 more or less. Um, and the Carolingians deposed the last king of the previous ruling family, the Merovingians. Um, and so I just wanted to say very briefly something about who the Carolingians are and the Merovingians and what we can learn from this, uh, from this uh, event. Um, the Carolingians, um, who are most famous for the figure of Charlemagne, uh, perhaps the, 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 the most renowned king in all of medieval history, uh, the Carolingians had served as basically chiefs of staff for uh, the Merovingian dynasty for uh, over a century uh, by the time we get to the middle of the uh, 700s. They gained a particular luster um, for their role in defending 
uh, the Frankish realm against uh, Arab incursions from Spain in the, uh, the 720s and 730s. Um, only in 751, however, did this um, ambitious family actually seize royal authority outright. Um, and there developed this uh, kind of um, uh, uh, cliche, if you will, among um, uh, or this, this, this bias among pro Carolingian chroniclers um, uh, of the time that lampooned the old Merovingian uh, dynasty as basically kings in name only. But in fact, the origins of this dynasty reached all the way back to uh, three centuries, all the way back to the late Roman Empire. Uh, the very first of the Merovingian uh, kings, Clovis, had converted the Franks to Christianity. So even if this dynasty was pretty useless, um, they had a formidable legacy that the Carolingians had to contend with. So um, the particular acts that accompanied uh, the transition of power from the Mer Merovingians to the Carolingians were very, very important. Um, according to one source, uh, the first of the Carolingian uh, kings, uh, Pippin the Great, uh, was, quote, chosen king by all the Franks in accordance with ancient tradition, uh, probably at, uh, at an assembly, um, which was, 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 was no doubt meant to imply that this revolution was not, in fact, a radical break uh, with the past, but that it represented a continuity of Frankish political heritage. Um, likewise, uh, Pippin received submission from the bishops of the Frankish realm and from, uh, as, as, as Einhard, the biographer of Charlemagne put it, um, all the great men, uh, which cemented the notion that both the church and the aristocracy um, had given sanction to this, uh, this transfer of power. Um, and then uh, probably most famously in an attempt to uh, kind of co-opt the aura of Rome, um, the, 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 the sacred center of Latin Christendom, uh, the Carolingians asked Pope uh, Zacharias to acknowledge Pippin as king, which he did since in his famous words, quote, it was better to call him king who actually had royal power than the one who didn't uh, have royal power. Um, the moment that I think really popped into my mind when, when I first thought about talking about this transition from the Merovingians to the Carolingians was uh, the, um, the fact that uh, the last of the Merovingian kings, uh, Childeric III, when he was removed from the throne was, uh, was, was, was tonsured. So he got um, the kind of monastic, the, the, the had his head shaved like a, uh, like a monk uh, and he was forced to enter uh, a cloister. And this sounds humiliating um, and no doubt it was meant to be in a way humiliating, but it was also a statement by the Carolingians about their, their moderation and uh, their mercy, um, which we can appreciate if we think about um, how the Merovingians uh, themselves, um, who were often uh, a dynasty divided among competing uh, royal lines, if we think about how the Merovingians treated their rivals. Um, and when in the Merovingian, in Merovingian political society, not infrequently, uh, these transfers of power were bloody and vindictive. Um, one of my favorite stories is uh, from the late sixth century when uh, one king within the Merovingian line, uh, Childebert II, reminded his rival uh, Guntram that the acts that had, this is quoted from the, the main source for the period, that the axe that had been driven into the heads of Guntram's brothers was still close at hand. And as Childebert is alleged to have said, it will soon strike yours um, about, um, uh, about Guntram. And it's worth noting that when Childebert himself was a little boy, uh, he had narrowly escaped being murdered by the assassins who struck down his father. Um, so again, I think you can see the pattern here. Um, this was not uncommon, this, this pattern of violence not uncommon uh, in the period. Um, among the Visigothic rulers of Spain, transfers of power so frequently involved murder that one seventh century Frankish, Frankish chronicler uh, actually termed assassination, the Gothic disease. Um, and then we have the Byzantine East uh, where the late seventh century and the early eighth century were marked by uh, a gruesome pattern of violence, um, uh, for example, when a general named Le uh, Leontius deposed Emperor Justinian II, he had Justinian's face mutilated. And when Justinian came back to power later, um, he was known by the epithet slit nose um, because of his, uh, his, his, his scarring. Um, more common were blindings, at least two Byzantine imperial transitions uh, in the decades leading up to uh, the time of Pippin the Great uh, in the West uh, involved um, Byzantines putting out the eyes of their deposed 
rivals. So Childeric III was no doubt very relieved to be treated the way he was by the, the Carolingians. Um, so just a couple of questions, I think, of broader significance to keep in mind uh, based on this very old history. Uh, what deeds mark transitions of power and grant legitimacy to new rulers? How do those deeds telegraph uh, what groups of people are to have a voice in transitions of power? Uh, and how might transitions of power be accompanied by transgressive violence or uh, the deliberate and performative avoidance of violence? So I'll stop there. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for sticking to time as well. Um, for those of you who have just joined us, um, my name is Amy Woodson Bolton. I'm moderating. Um, I'm a, a professor in the history department. Um, that was Professor Anthony Perrin, who's a historian of medieval Europe. Up next is Professor Kevin McDonald, who's a historian of the Atlantic world. I will put his information in the chat. Um, so Professor McDonald, if you are ready, you can take it away. Yes, uh, thank you, Amy. Uh, and thank you everyone for being part of this panel. Um, as a um, historian of, of pirates, I just want to preface my remarks as my students will tell you that uh, pirates who were violent criminals um, held uh, democratic elections, both to elect and depose uh, their captains as well as signing articles. But I wanna focus my comments today on uh, another transition of power uh, that is revolutions, particularly uh, revolutions of the 18th century, what we commonly term as Atlantic revolutions and briefly juxtapose two of those revolutions, the American Revolution and the Haitian Revolution, uh, which have been treated very differently, um, both at the time by contemporaries, uh, as well as since. And in these revolutions, we're talking about in the Enlightenment, Enlightenment period, the transition uh, from subject to citizen, right? The, the people uh, becoming uh, citizens as they were formerly subjects uh, in empires uh, or by royal authorities. And revolutions, of course, come in many shapes and sizes, uh, political, social, cultural, uh, often political revolutions um, were and are violent. And the American Revolution um, is, of course, no, ex no exception. It was a violent insurrection, right, against uh, the British Empire, which is celebrated uh, every 4th of July, right, in the nation, um, juxtaposed against the Haitian Revolution, which was also a political revolution, uh, but it was fought by formerly and then currently enslaved um, Africans in Haiti. And so the American Revolution has been um, traditionally uh, celebrated, whereas the Haitian Revolution and Haiti itself um, was ignored by the very founding fathers. Thomas Jefferson, uh, who was the third president, um, would not diplomatically recognize Haiti. In fact, Haiti was not recognized until the time um, of the Civil War. So some of the questions that emerge from juxtaposing these revolutions, right, are uh, about who has the right to be a citizen, um, how are revolutions uh, remembered. Um, part of it, of course, is the, is the literal whitewashing of, of history. Um, one event in particular from the American Revolution, the, the Boston Massacre, um, was a riot by um, Bostonians um, who were assaulting uh, British soldiers, um, and the British soldiers responded by firing into the crowd. And when they fired into the crowd, uh, they killed a man named Crispus Attucks, who was a black man. And a uh, famous engraving by Paul Revere was then circulated throughout the colonies uh, to build support for the colony of Massachusetts uh, in 1770. Um, and in that engraving, um, Crispus Attucks is mentioned, um, but he's depicted as white. Uh, he's literally been uh, whitewashed from history, just as Haiti initially was whitewashed from history. Um, Haiti was an international pariah. Um, no one recognized the nation. Again, the U.S. not until the time uh, of the Civil War when Frederick Douglass became the first ambassador, first American ambassador uh, to Haiti. Um, 
the other piece, and again, my, my time is brief, is reflecting on this, the symbolism of the revolutions, in particular, uh, the American Revolution, and, and especially what we've seen the past few years and what we all witnessed uh, with our own eyes um, on the television screens and our computer screens last week is the appropriation and, and often the misappropriation of the symbols of the American Revolution. Uh, things like tea parties, um, the Gadsden flag, which is the flag of the, uh, the snake and the don't tread on me symbol. Um, these uh, revolutionary symbols have been appropriated by the far right. Uh, the very term patriot, right, which we associate with the American Revolution now has been uh, bandied about and, and tagged uh, by the president of these um, uh, violent insurrectionists who stormed the Capitol um, last week. Um, later symbols, of course, of the Confederacy, the Confederate flag um, are now common in the uh, alt-right movement. And so one question I have is, um, about the appropriation and misappropriation. Um, what are we celebrating um, with these symbols? Um, the bigger question of this transition from um, subject to citizen, right, is, is who is the citizen? Uh, who belongs to this nation? Um, who has the right to vote? Uh, we've seen voter suppression um, since the time uh, of the American Revolution throughout the 19th and 20th century and in, in recent times. Um, who is American? In other words, who is American and who has the rights of an American? These are issues that began uh, in the 1770s, um, were enshrined with the Declaration of Independence where uh, Thomas Jefferson, who denied uh, recognition of Haiti, said all men are created equal. Uh, yet the Constitution um, said that um, Black persons were three-fifths of a person. And of course, we have a whole history uh, of the 19th and 20th century uh, between now and then. So I will end my remarks uh, on, on that note. And again, just throw out there for discussion these very important questions uh, in American history about the rights of citizenships and how they intersect with white power and white privilege, which we've seen from the founding of the nation. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for staying uh, to your time. Uh, for those of you who have just joined us, um, and I'm so excited to see so many people coming to get a historical perspective on this. My name is Amy Woodson Bolton. I'm a professor of uh, British and Irish history. Um, that was Kevin McDonald, historian of the Atlantic world. Next up is Professor Nigel Robb, who's a historian of modern Russia. Um, so uh, take it away, Nigel. Thank you, Professor Woodson Bolton. Um, I have to begin by saying, because my background is Siberia, it's Yakutsk, I have to begin by saying it's minus 60 outside in this place right now today. I want to start uh, just by making a comment about succession itself, because what we're dealing with today is an election, and there's doubting of an election. So our system of succession is electoral. And sometimes when, when we look back in history and we think of inheriting your position, like, you know, the injustice of the queen, just because you're the firstborn child, you know, you inherit the queen's position. But one of the things it did, especially in the 16th century in Russia, they had a very, very rigid system of succession. It was very well ordered. And what it did is it prevented civil war. If you knew more or less who were potential competitors to be the Tsar or the great prince back then, I mean, you avoided all sorts of potential conflicts. So they, the, the succession system was very important for stability. Ivan the Terrible in the late 16th century, he did many things. He also hit his son over the head with an iron rod and his son didn't survive being hit over the head with an iron rod. And so what happened is there was no succession. And so in Russia, and this is important, you get a period of about 23 years called the time of troubles which is designed to solve this succession crisis. I mean, this is an incredibly long, long time period. During that time period, in you know, the beginning of the 16th century, you have what are called the false Dimitris. So because there's an idea of succession, you have strangers, unknown people who say, no, I'm the next Tsar, and they present themselves in the mode of having a rightful inheritance to the Russian crown. That's, 
that's sort of the, the rule of succession there. Ultimately, what happened at the end of the time of troubles in 1613 is the Romanov dynasty was started. It came out of this collapse, of, it came out of this succession crisis, and the Romanov dynasty lasted until the revolution of 1917. Another instance is early 18th century with Peter the Great. Peter the Great passes a law in 1722, which says the ruler determines the actual successor. It's not inheritance. It's the ruler, the current ruler gets to choose, gets to choose who's the next ruler. And this was because Peter the Great did not trust his son and wanted to make the decision himself. He actually incarcerated his son and his son, you know, didn't, didn't really survive. But what that did, and again, from from 1730 until around 1740, you have this very unstable period in Russia because there's no set person ready to take over. And so there's a lot of jostling that goes around. So these inheritance laws were actually, uh, and succession laws, they're actually very important for stability. In other times in Russia, like Catherine the Great murders her husband, that's not so much a succession crisis. That's just like, a, I want power crisis. So that's, that's not quite the same thing. The next really important succession crisis, which I think is the, the model for Russia, is 1825. And 1825 is the Decemberist Rebellion, because what happens is Alexander I died, and Konstantin was meant to be the next in line, but Konstantin didn't want power and passed it to his brother, who would become Nicholas I. In this instance, what's interesting is that rebels, the Decemberists, maybe you've heard the band or read about them, these rebels took advantage of the ambiguity of the succession crisis and staged what has been called, maybe exaggerated, the first Russian revolution. So in 1825, in December, you have officers on Senate Square in St. Petersburg, and they're meant to give an oath to the new Tsar, Nicholas I. But they say, we are not taking an oath to the new Tsar Nicholas I, because he is not the rightful successor to the throne. And they basically refuse to do this. Nicholas I decides, because it's winter in St. Petersburg, we cannot let this go into night. And you see how important night is in terms of rebellion then and now, we have to, we have to shut this down. So what he does is he opens, gets calls the army up, it's his first day on the job, and he says, fire on the officers, fire on the crowd fires on them, they disperse, and it's immediately put down. End of the succession crisis, Nicholas I becomes the ruler for the next 30 years. He put an end to the rebellion, but the model of rebellion, that would persist, that was for Lenin. Lenin was like, this is the revolution, the first one, we move on from there. It became, again, threatening the Tsar, rebelling against the Tsar in 1825. It failed, but it became an inspiration for all future generations of Russian revolutionaries. And then Lenin reads about this. If you Soviet textbooks always teach about this. So that example lasted well, well, well into the 20th century. And I think I am done on my five minutes. So I will, I'll stop there, but those are just some examples from Russian history. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for being your own timekeeper there. So uh, next up, we have Professor Elizabeth Drummond, uh, historian of modern Germany and Central Europe, and also the current chair of the Department of History. Uh, so Elizabeth, uh, it's your turn. Oh, there you go. Elizabeth, you are muted. Yep. Thanks very much. Uh, Amy, um, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, you can? Yes. Okay. Um, so as uh, Professor Whitson Bolton said, I am a historian of modern Central Europe, uh, Germany in particular, and I was watching last week's coup attempt as uh, I was working on my Weimar, Weimar Germany syllabus. Um, discussions of fascism and comparisons to Weimar have been frequent in the news in the age of Trump. Um, and as a German historian, I have to say that I'm always a little bit wary of comparisons that invoke national socialism, but I think that studying Weimar can help us make sense of what is happening today. So I just want to give two very brief examples of uh, transitions of power involving Weimar Germany, one at the beginning and one at the end of the Republic. So the Weimar Republic, um, as some of you may know, was born in the context of World War I. Uh, when the German Empire collapsed under the pressures of war, 
uh, with the emperor, the Kaiser, abdicating and social democratic politicians declaring the establishment of a republic. Now, there's a lot of discussion about whether or not this was a revolution um, and the extent to which it was or was not a revolution, but that is a conversation for a different day. Um, what I want to stress today is that this brand new republic first had to agree to the armistice to end World War I and then was the uh, government that had to sign the Versailles Treaty, which was widely perceived in Germany um, as more about vengeance than about peace. Uh, these events gave rise to the idea of the Dolchstoss, uh, or the stab in the back, uh, which was this idea that came from conservative and nationalist politicians and military officers, most notably from uh, Paul von Hindenburg, who was chief of the German general staff during World War I. Uh, and they argued that military victory would still have been possible, but for the betrayal of civilian politicians and the collapse of the home front. Um, the military, they said, had been stabbed in the back by social democrats, communists, and Jews. Now, most historians agree um, that this stab in the back theory was a complete myth. Um, there was no chance for German victory on the battlefield. Um, most, uh, many contemporary observers uh, agreed uh, about that as well. Um, but the, the myth uh, and the argument, the image of the stab in the back wounded uh, the young Weimar Republic, particularly given the severity of the crises that it faced, including hyperinflation and political violence on both extremes. And there was a good deal of political violence in the early years of the Weimar Republic as the nature of the new Republic was contested um, by the center um, and then by the left, especially the extreme left and by then increasingly nationalist and the extreme right um, as well. Uh, there were uprisings, coups, putches, um, from communists, uh, from nationalists, and most famously Hitler's failed beer hall putsch of November 1923, which occurred on the fifth anniversary of the revolution. Um, of note here, I think, uh, and this is in some ways relevant for our discussions uh, in this country today, uh, a conservative and nationalist judiciary in Germany was much more lenient as regards right-wing nationalist violence than it was as regards left-wing violence. Uh, it gave Hitler, for example, um, a, a pretty, uh, first of all, a platform uh, for his ideas at his trial and then only a very light sentence, um, which he served only a, a small part of. Um, now, I do want to stress here that the Weimar Republic stabilized after 1923, but support for it was always contested. It was often shallow, more pragmatic than out of a sense of real loyalty. And when we think in terms of rituals of legitimation, the stab in the back legend gained sufficient currency in Germany to prevent the development of a real sense of legitimacy for the Weimar Republic. It meant that the new symbols and rituals that would come with that legitimacy, a new flag, celebrations of the constitution, perhaps even a national holiday, which was never, which never emerged, found it really difficult to take hold universally. What that meant was that when Weimar faced another set of crises in the context of the Great Depression at the end of the 1920s and the beginning of the 1930s, it did not have the confidence of the population to survive. There was insufficient confidence in the uh, Republic itself, but also in its democratic structures. Uh, now, again, the rise of the Nazis and their seizure of power is far more complex than we can get into here. Um, but I do want to stress that the Nazis actually shifted their strategies from attempted coups in 1923 to exploiting constitutional and electoral politics in the 1930s. But the Nazis were always a minority party. 33% was their share of the vote in the last free elections in Germany, which coincidentally is the same percentage as Trump's current approval rating. Um, so the Nazis relied on alliances with the old right who shared their national, their radical nationalism and anti-Semitism, if not always uh, their embrace of their goals and methods and on legal maneuvers such as the enabling act and referenda to legitimize their actions. So one of the things that Hitler did after he seized power after he was appointed chancellor 
um, by the then president, Paul von Hindenburg, he of the stab in the back, um, was after Hindenburg died and Hitler merged the positions of president and chancellor into the Fuhrer, he held a referendum to have the public the masses, the, the um, sort of popular opinion, reinforce and legitimize that move. Um, so I, what I'm trying to get at here is the ways in which uh, legitimacy can be made or unmade in a variety of different ways. And I will stop there. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Uh, a reminder for our attendees to put your questions in the Q&A. Um, we'll be getting to those um, after the next presentation, which is by Professor Sean Dempsey. So this is our final presentation, and then we'll move to the Q&A. Uh, Professor Dempsey is a historian of the modern United States. Um, I will put uh, his information in the chat, and uh, Professor Dempsey, take it away. Thank you so much, Professor Woodson Bolton, and welcome to everyone. Um, I just like to talk in the time I have about uh, two uh, tumultuous and contested elections and transition periods uh, between administrations uh, in more modern US history. And I think both of them are not only important historically, but perhaps shed light or pro pose questions for us as we're analyzing uh, rightfully with some horror um, the events of the last week or two uh, in the United States. Um, the first uh, you might have been reading or hearing quite a bit about lately is the 1876 election uh, between Rutherford B. Hayes, the Republican, and Samuel Tilden, the Democrat. Um, this was a genuinely contested election. Uh, four different states, uh, Oregon, um, here in the West, as well as South Carolina, Louisiana, and Florida, actually did submit competing slates of electors. Uh, and the context there is that, although Oregon's reasons were somewhat different, for those three Southern states, you uh, were witnessing uh, the attempt uh, by uh, white conservatives to take back power, um, sort of at the tail end of the Reconstruction period. Um, I'll just be very brief uh, that, um, as you might know, this was uh, a, a, an election that did go and was contested in Congress. Um, there, Yes, there was talk during that election as to whether the sitting vice president could decide the results. Um, so there's actually a, a historical precedent for that. Although then and now it was decided that the vice president didn't have that power. What basically wound up happening is that a commission was formed, uh, a 15 person commission that ruled eight to seven that Rutherford B. Hayes' electors should be seated and counted. Um, but at that point, Southern Democratic senators um, uh, threatened, uh, threatened to delay uh, the actual certification of the election. And uh, then you had the so-called corrupt bargain uh, in which Democrats uh, agreed to stand down and allow Hayes to be president, um, but with the promise that the federal government would no longer have military troops in the South and that federal law enforcement uh, would no longer uh, enforce basically the reconstruction amendments that had guaranteed um, equality, at least political equality for black men um, in the South. Um, this had horrible consequences for American history. It opened the door for anti-democratic uh, politics in the South for the next several decades. Uh, it allowed for the Jim Crow system to build and flourish. Um, and perhaps most horrifyingly wound up with actual coups um, on a local level, uh, most notoriously in 1898 in Wilmington, North Carolina, in which a white mob uh, stormed City Hall uh, and killed and injured dozens of people in order to remove uh, a rightfully elected uh, interracial government. Um, and so um, what happened in the US Capitol was unprecedented on a federal level. Um, however, similar things had occurred throughout the late 19th century in the South um, that looked uh, shockingly quite similar to what we saw last week. Um, the other election I just wanted to mention briefly was the 1932 election between Hoover, uh, Herbert Hoover and FDR at the very depths of the depression. This was also a very fraught transition. Um, Hoover 
believe that FDR and his promised New Deal were an existential threat to the United States. Um, and in many ways, Hoover pioneers conservative rhetoric that frames uh, liberalism as somehow uh, a slippery slope to communism, socialism, and the end of the republic as we know it. This was a transition that also involved violence. Uh, FDR was nearly assassinated in Miami during the transition period. Uh, instead, that assassination attempt took the life of Chicago Mayor Anton Cermak, uh, who famously told FDR before he died in the hospital that he was glad it was him and not FDR, um, because indeed the New Deal hung in the balance of FDR surviving. FDR had a very conservative running mate, John Nance Gardner. Um, Hoover anticipated violence during that transition. However, he was convinced that this violence was going to come from the left um, and not seek to take the life of a president-elect Roosevelt. Uh, Hoover leaned on this uh, chaos uh, in order to try to actually get FDR to not implement the New Deal. In fact, he even offered to beef up FDR's uh, Secret Service detail if he would promise not to implement <laughs> the New Deal. Um, so Hoover, in a way, uh, was a very unsuccessful president, but in a way, he was a very successful ideologue. Um, he, in this transition period, he kind of defined a new kind of apocalyptic conservative politics um, and a fierce resistance to kind of progressive developments. Um, what I believe we're seeing now in the United States is the coming together of those two strands, um, the white supremacist element that had been part of the Democratic Party for decades, as well as this kind of reactionary conservative argument against liberalism that had been a strand of the Republican Party. Uh, now, in recent decades, those two illiberal, anti-democratic strands um, have fused together in one party, uh, which perhaps makes this moment uh, one of the most dangerous of all in U.S. history. Uh, so on that cheerful note, I'll leave it there. Oh my gosh, and you ended just as the timer was going. That was beautifully timed. Um, so I encourage all of our attendees to put questions uh, in the Q&A. We already have one uh, coming from Lucy. She writes, historically speaking, what is the role of cultural capital and racial power and privilege in terms of political legitimacy and revolutionary success? It's a really great question. Um, I know everyone probably has thoughts about that. Who, who wants to go first, let's say? I can start, I guess, Professor Woodson Bolton. I, I mean, I, I, I think it's stating the obvious. We, we've seen over the past year um, with the Black Lives Movement and how they were treated um, versus what happened last week, which was, um, I would say, both unsurprising on one level, but absolutely stunning uh, to see um, how easily the Capitol was overrun. Um, there's still, I think, open questions about what actually happened or didn't happen in, in the preparation uh, for that. Um, but there's clearly, again, I, I think, We've all we've all seen it. There's there there was a great discrepancy um, in what were generally peaceful protests, mostly last summer, um, and and the chaos and violence that ensued. And and we've seen it as well with open arms in some cases and the selfies and the support that um, the Capitol Police gave to. Um, to the rioters and insurrectionists last week, I, I think it's clear that there is a uh, racial privilege and power uh, that's deeply embedded um, in the current movement, but it also has a very deep history um, in, in this nation and a, and a fraught one at that. Yes, absolutely. Uh, does anyone does anyone else want to address this question of cultural capital and racial discrepancies? I can throw in a little bit from the context of the, uh, uh, the case study that I, that I talked about, um, although obviously it's very distant from, from what we're dealing with uh, in our own country today. But um, I mean, medieval transitions of power oftentimes did uh, involve uh, 
I would say kind of different cultural programs or different, um, and, and in some cases, different ethnic uh, affiliations. And in the case of the, the Carolingians, although it's, it's a bit murky, but um, it does seem that the Carolingians were kind of marshalling a certain um, resentment against uh, the kind of pull of, uh, of, of Romanization among the the Franks, um, that the Merovingians were a dynasty that had that had very thoroughly integrated and assimilated into uh, the kind of late antique Romanized culture of, uh, of Western Europe, whereas the Carolingians represented, uh, in their view, a kind of older style of Germanic Frankishness. Um, they, Charlemagne, for example, would have spoken Frankish, not uh, you know, a kind of transition between Latin and French, which would have been the language of court for the Merovingians. So there was a kind of question of cultural capital and uh, of which of these visions of kind of Frankishness would win out, a kind of uh, one that pulled back to the Germanic past or one that uh, was more closely associated with, uh, with, with, with Romanization. Um. Yeah, that's it, it's really interesting to think about our current, you know, historically determined uh, set of of differentials in power versus earlier earlier ones. Um, so there's a question here that actually I had really wanted to ask as well. Um, this is from Kelly, uh, who asks, "What role does military support play in power transfer? Is it essential for a successful transition of power?" Um, I, I really noticed also the, the different the differentials in in the role that armies can play um, in these different histories that we've heard today. Um, I don't know who wants to talk about that, the role of the military uh, or, or the army. Um, it certainly came to mind uh, as Professor Rob discussed Lenin um, and the differences between 1825 and 1917, but I probably all of you can say something about the role of the military there in establishing legitimacy. Is, is military support necessary or essential for a successful transition of power? I guess I could start off again. Um, Thank you. Well, I mean, in, in the American context, um, the military has had a little role, um, thankfully, in the transition of power. I mean, it's interesting. Right, the that that the first president Washington, right, was the uh, the general of the Continental Army, and um, one of the most important things he did um, as president, arguably, was to step down after two terms. He would have easily uh, won election for a third term, and that set the precedent, um, which wasn't in the Constitution at the time, uh, of of two terms that changed uh, after FDR earlier in the, in the 20th century during World War II. Um, but I think it is a, an, an excellent question for the current moment uh, because of what happened last week. And now we see uh, the last few days, uh, the images of the National Guardsmen sleeping in the Capitol. Um, you know, this is something I think probably the last time it happened maybe was in 1812 when the British uh, burned down half of Washington. Uh, but I, thankfully in American history, the military has not had a prominent role. Um, uh, of course it won, won the revolution, uh, but then you know has kind of been in the background. So I think it's something that we're gonna have to watch. And, and of course the military, the current mil military leaders um, did something I think unprecedented and, and uh, released a memo stating that um, that Joe Biden won the election. I mean, that's that's where we are right now, and and it, it's frightening, as Sean said. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Professor Rob, do you want to go next? Yeah, just to talk about the the Russian situation, where if you think of somebody like Lenin, Lenin has a revolution. I mean, this is this is, and it's a violent revolution, and that's the entire intent. So. He's not, that, that's less of a succession crisis than the idea we're just gonna have a completely new system. Whereas if you think, for example, in 1881, Alexander II was assassinated and Alexander III takes over. That's not a succession crisis because it, there's just absolutely no doubt whatsoever that Alexander III is gonna take over. So you don't really need the military in that case. What they needed and what they worried about were just terrorists assassinating people. And that's, 
that was certainly what they had to worry about. But it wasn't it wasn't a succession crisis, and that's why in many instances, like Nicholas II to Alexander II, there's no succession crisis. Um, so if you think about that, like once 1825 has passed, Russia does not does not again have a succession crisis. It has a revolution, but it doesn't have a succession crisis. So it's you know, interesting. The, yeah, it's interesting to think though the way that Lenin was able to to radicalize the army right on the Eastern Front and really turn the army itself into a revolutionary force. I probably. You probably turned uh, half the army into a revolution. Yeah, well, if you got half the army, right? I mean, that's the big, that's 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 pretty good. <laughs> well, that's why they have a civil war afterwards. That's the out that's the outcome of that right. of that right. the civil war. But that's but that's very much a revolutionary situation where yeah. like he wants basically we're done with this. Whereas I don't think I mean I, Kevin and Sean can answer that one is I mean is there an attempt to put in a completely different style of American government? that is, you know, a radically new form, like a, yeah, whatever yeah, that's it is. a great, that, that's a great point. And when is it something, when, when, it, when does something tip over into revolution as opposed to a transition between two, two different systems? Yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, uh, Professor Drummond, I saw, I saw your, I love calling on my colleagues. <laughs> I think Tony also uh, wants to chime in, but I will just say very um, briefly that um, obviously the 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 fact that the the what the remnants really of the German army because Versailles affected what the German army could do in the Weimar Republic, their lack not just lack of support but active attempts to undermine Weimar um, uh, played a, a fairly important role. Um, and so while that wasn't sort of military power out in the streets, the same way that we might think of it normally, the ways in which the military as a respected institution within the country um, tipped the balance for, for some people was important. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Professor Perrin. Um, I think the question about uh, the role of the military actually is an interesting one in light of, um, I see there's another question about um, power and authority. And I think it gets back to the issue of power versus legitimacy and military might is necessary perhaps, but not sufficient um, in that, what is the, you know, what is the claim to legitimacy? I mean, what is the cultural and ideological program uh, and the social vision that goes along with an otherwise violent transfer of power uh, in order to give it something that has purchase with people's people's minds, you know, um, and, and, and their, their, their kind of spirit, if you will. But um, uh, I mean, I think any, any transition that is only about military power is, 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 is not going to be very lasting. Um, it needs, even if it starts that way, it needs to build something that is, uh, that is ideological to, to undergird that. Right, there's a real difference between, as you say, just a violent overthrow versus actually having popular support, um, which goes back to what Professor Drummond was talking about in terms of Weimar and its kind of, you know, essentially failure to put the deep roots of legitimacy um, because of all of the, uh, you know, all of the challenges the Weimar uh, uh, regime faced. Um, the uh, we have a question um, about that's actually specifically about uh, Germany and other parts of Europe. Um, Kevin asks, why do you think that Germany and other parts of Europe eventually began to support left wing leaders, uh, sorry, right wing leaders instead of left wing ones during the 1920s and 30s? Was this possibly a reaction to the USSR? Yeah, so that's that's a very involved question um, that could have a very long answer. I'm going to um, try and keep it very short instead. Um, I think we need to remember that there was considerable support for leftist movements um, in Germany and elsewhere in Europe. Um, one of the reasons why the right wing was able to seize power, well, a couple reasons um, why the right wing was able to seize power in Germany uh, I think had to do, and again, this gets back to issues of power that other people have asked about, um, was the, the ways in which people who were already in positions of power were sympathetic to nationalist rather and right-wing rather than, than left-wing ideas, right? 
Um, and so there are many historians who argue that the move towards radical nationalism and fascism was actually a way to keep, keep power to combat the threat of a rising uh, left. Um, and certainly they were able to make effective use of anti-communism as part of their ideological appeals. But specifically to Weimar Germany, I think the other thing to keep in mind was that the left wing was fractured, um, that the Communist Party and the Social Democratic Party uh, were at odds with each other, in fact, hated each other and did not come into a popular front. Um, and there's, I think, a very important lesson there for the United States um, about how you have um, united fronts against uh, fascist and authoritarian um, radical nationalist threats. And, and I will leave it at that. Um, Kevin, I think, you, I think you might be in my Weimar Germany class, so we can talk more about that then. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Right. And this hopefully I just as a plug for history classes. I mean, these, this is this is exactly the kind of stuff you get to talk about in history classes. So um, always why you should take history classes, even if you are not a history major or minor. Um, here's a question. Um, and I imagine that this will be really for Professor Dempsey. Um, the, the anonymous attendee asks, this is a pretty specific question. But what power would the Democratic Party have had to prevent Rutherford's election if the corrupt bargain had not happened? And would they have been successful? So that's an interesting, interesting kind of counterfactual there. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, um, well, uh, it's pretty clear, I should say, that um, Hayes won the election. Um, because those competing slates from the South uh, that claim that Tilden had won were undoubtedly corrupt themselves. Because uh, keep in mind, in a state like South Carolina at that time, actually had a Black majority. And, and the uh, former Confederates by the 14th Amendment were barred from holding federal office, um, et cetera. So uh, this was part of a, of a campaign to retake political power by uh, often violently suppressing the Black vote or uh, submitting these competing slates, as you saw states trying to do with Trump, although these were actually submitted um, in, a, in, in sort of a quasi-official capacity. The reason it's called a corrupt bargain is for precisely that reason. Um, had the Republicans and Hayes sort of fought more, they could have sort of crushed this uh, push to delegitimize that election um, and, asserted, and asserted their rightful authority. Um, the reason they didn't is for several reasons. Um, one, the Republican Party had kind of moved by then away from its strongly abolitionist roots and its uh, pro-Black roots that, uh, that had held sway during the Civil War, um, of course. Um, and there was a large movement at that time uh, for the nation to sort of put the Civil War and those divisions behind it. And most historians have pointed out the fact that the way in which the nation decided to put the Civil War behind it was for Northern whites and Southern whites to come back together in harmony um, and often to the exclusion um, of, of African Americans um, in the South. So in other words, the Republican Party had uh, given up some of their zeal that they had once had to actually creating a multiracial democracy that had characterized their platform back in the 1860s. Um, so that's, I think, some of the reason why it's called a corrupt bargain, that if the Republicans had sort of held true to their former principles and really decided to deploy power against these Southern white Democrats, it might have worked. Uh, but instead, the nation went down a very different road. Yeah, that's, that's, um, it's, that's, super, that's super helpful. Um, our next question comes from uh, Professor Banks. She asks, what stands out to the panelists about the role of television or social media in this insurrection? What does it mean for so many people to see this insurrection in real time and for the images to be exchanged by a social media after the fact? So kind of thinking about the difference between um, this moment and earlier social media and media environments. I don't know who wants to take that one on. 
I was listening to something this morning about the choices that photographers are making about which images to shoot, right? As you're in the midst of something like that. Um, uh, and one photographer was speaking specifically about the, the photograph that circulated quite, um, quite a bit of, from inside, I think it's the house chamber um, where security officers have their guns drawn and are very close to the face of um, uh, one of the people on the outside who's trying to get in. Um, I mean, I think there there are all sorts of interesting things that are ha that happen when you're watching a, an insurrection in real time, right? Um, which was something that you know happens. It happens very differently in different um, media landscapes. Um, what I found most interesting about the sort of social media and media dynamics of all of this is the ways in which it has been possible to go back in and identify people after the fact, um, to break down what has happened, um, to change our accounts. I, I don't mean change our accounts, but change interpretation of things. So there's the, the one video of the black Capitol police officer who's running up the stairs. And initially it looks like he's, you know, sort of just in retreat and there's weakness there. Um, except what we know now looking at it again is that he looks to the left, he actually secures the Senate, you know, basically sees that the Senate chamber is unsecured and leads people. So we have the ability to, um, to, to do that kind of work because of the um, how many images there are. I mean, I do think there are gonna be some interesting questions to be raised about how we're using images now to identify people and um, basically using facial recognition technology and social media um, and, and what that means uh, for all these sorts of things. And I think those are that those sorts of issues are still coming to the fore. And I'm, you know, those are things that we criticized, right? The use of do, like how we used images to do that during Black Lives Matter, that was criticized, right? And, you know, it was encouraged for photographers to be very careful that they didn't dox people through their uh, photographs. And now what we're seeing is that it's, it's, we're using, we're doing the same thing, but we value it differently because because of the different contexts. And that's not to say that the, those contexts aren't important. I think they are, but it makes it a much more complicated conversation about social media. It's really interesting, you know, as you were speaking about that, that one instance of the film being reconsidered, it really made me think of the Zapruder film footage of President Kennedy being assassinated and how our limited our images of that were compared to now, right? And how we had to rely on very, you know, just a, a very few uh, images of that event and trying to analyze them. Whereas now we would have, everyone would have their own phone and their own images and, and the kind of explosion of uh, perspectives. Uh, yeah, Professor McDonald. Yeah, I would just, uh, you know, I have a, a few different thoughts and Elizabeth touched on a few of them, sort of the double-edged sword nature of the rioters using social media at the time to communicate with each other and to plan the event um, and the brazenness of them to to take pictures to take selfies and to um, to then publish them and that's going to be how most of them are going to be caught and tracked down um, so I, I it is a fascinating element of of what's happened and of course you know the past four years um the president has has used the platform of twitter as his as megaphone and him being shut out of that now is a big part of this story of course so i think and and the other piece of it is in in real time there weren't the live images that have come out since what was happening inside the capitol Right, mm -hmm. most of the the real time images were were the chaos that was happening outside, and the the violence of the rioters really came out. I think afterwards, in the, in the few days afterwards, of the footage that was captured inside, uh, of the incredible violence uh, that was being um, committed inside uh, inside the Capitol building. So. Uh, I, I think that's, you know, it's something that we're going to be unpacking for, for quite some time, I 
Absolutely, and how close things came to being really catastrophic. I think that that has played a role. And it's interesting, I think all of this points out the, the way, you know, it, the history uh, historians and students in history classes spend a lot of time thinking about how we tell the past, what do narratives do? And what's interesting here is we're seeing the narrative change as you both have pointed out, uh, even as, as we're all uh, kind of processing this. Um, there's a question here, a really interesting question about the role of education in transfers of power. What is the role of education in transfers of power? Can shortcomings in education systems fuel resistance to transfers of power from certain classes or groups? Is and you know so that's kind of an a, an interesting question about is this uh, is this uh, I've seen a lot of people saying oh we you know we got rid of civics classes we got rid of history classes you know this is what happens when people don't um, kind of understand the broader context for this um, or even information literacy critical thinking. Um, does anyone want to uh, speak to that? Oh, sorry, Professor Perrin. Sorry, um, I, I can't address that that whole question. It's a very good one and a, and a complicated one. But I know, I mean, I can speak from the kind of the long durée perspective of uh, of a pre modernist that. Um, that, 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 that education and a cultural program are intimately connected with these big transfers uh, of power. And, and, and again, I go back, I, I didn't actually think in the q and I would end up talking so much about the Carolingians, but it does seem like such a good uh, example because um, one of the things that, um, that the Carolingians did very, you know, within the, 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 the first generation or the first two generations of Carolingian rule was to adopt um, essentially a complete cultural program that involved things like even revising the, the handwriting that was used to copy manuscripts, um, to uh, you know, setting up um, a kind of um, you, you know, like at, at court having historians uh, writing the history of the Carolingians, obviously from a pro-Carolingian perspective, uh, writing epic poetry and uh, verses of praise for Carolingian rulers, um, but also and and, uh, and and I think this gets to the the question of legitimacy and 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 the kind of ideology and cultural program of legitimacy and how that's communicated uh, to a wide audience. Um, the Carolingians also pioneered really the first kind of public education system in in European history. Um, uh, every parish was supposed to establish a school, um, you know, with different levels of education depending on uh, the size of the uh, of, of, of the district and so forth. But um, uh, so it wasn't so much that education itself had had prompted the Carolingian revolution, but it was it was one of the ways in which once the Carolingians had taken power, that power was cemented. Um, and I and you know, it gets there, there's I see there's another question about kind of length of uh, of, of 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 the the duration of uh, of a regime and whether that kind of safeguards against changes in power. I mean, one of the ways that that can happen is that if 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 the regime has controlled the educational system enough to be able to you know inculcate their values in generation after generation of people, then yes, I can I can see that happening. Which is really interesting too, in terms of thinking about how what is the relationship, let's say, between a system of education now and alternative sources of information, as we see with the sorts of extreme right wing um, information sources uh, for really disinformation and misinformation, um, which is you know some maybe something we could talk about as well. Uh, Professor Drummond, you had had your hand up about the education question. Yeah, I was just th I'm thinking of this actually not in terms of Weimar Germany, but post-war Germany and the two educational systems that emerged out of that and the importance that um, they both played for inculcating a, and developing a new sense of identity, um, national identity, but also that's attached obviously to the, the legitimacy of the state. Um, and they they articulated that in very different ways, right? So in West Germany, it was um, talking about uh, a sort of liberal de democratic um, values and capitalism, and in East Germany, it was about anti-fascism. Um, and the the sort of longer term success of that also depends on those values that are being taught being meaningful to the people who are being taught them, right? And and that there's there is a match between 
what is being taught and what the government is also delivering. Um, so where there's a disconnect between a rhetoric um, that is um, being pushed through an educational system and the, re and the lived experiences that people are having, um, that educational system might not actually end up supporting um, the legitimacy of the state in the same way. Um, in post-war West Germany, there's a, uh, and still now, there's a whole um, governmental agency for what they call political education, um, which sounds a little ominous, but it's really uh, civics. Um, and the idea that, uh, and I think this is a reaction, of course, to the experience of Nazism, that um, values need to be taught and reinforced and lived and made real and made meaningful um, uh, throughout uh, culture and society. It is interesting to think about, and this goes back to something Professor Dempsey said uh, earlier about kind of our ability or inability to really envision even what a multiracial democracy looks like. And I think so much of that has to do with kind of reimagining what a civics um, would, would, what political, what a political education or civics to, to inculcate that would look like. Uh, yeah, Professor Roth. Dare I stay, Russia might be the model of a multi-ethnic democracy. <laughs> shock, shock. But um, one of the things in terms of, you know, the, the, the passing of the Cold War and, and our negative attitude towards Russia, and Russia has definite authoritarian problems, but it also is a very multi-ethnic state. And you can go, you can go to the Urals, you can go to Siberia, you can go to Tatarstan, and all these cities are very, very diverse. And yet it's a traditional American attitude, which says we don't learn from anybody else but ourselves. And yet, like Russia, the, the, the government in Moscow has a, I guess, you, what, what would you call it, like a presidential advisory committee on multinational issues. It had the, the Duma has a advisory committee on multinational issues and all the cities have this. And I mean, it's, it's throughout the entire country and they proudly announce, and it's a very, very imperfect policy, but they proudly announce that like, there are a hundred languages spoken in Russia and stuff like that. Yet they never get the impression that Americans want to learn from that, so. That's a, that's a fantastic and fascinating uh, example of a different, absolutely different way of envisioning, which of course the Soviets had used as well. But it, yeah, as you say, complete, you know, again, we, to, to what extent did the Cold War warp Americans' ability to, to engage with that kind of example? Um, Professor McDonald. Yeah, just to add real quickly and kind of flip it around on the education question, the, the two ringleaders um, Cruz and Hawley um, are very well educated, right? Harvard and Yale Law School each, um, and yet stood there and lied and, and helped um, perpetuate, you know, the events that happened last week. And so, you know, the education question is important, uh, but I think we also have to hold people's feet to the fire um, uh, in addition to, you know, the insiders up on the stage, um, those inside the Capitol also, uh, the well-educated ones also have a direct responsibility to, to what next week. This, uh, yeah, yeah really interesting point. Um, the, this question I think does slide really nicely into the next one about can the longevity of a state safeguard its transfers of power um, I don't know if anybody wants to talk about that. Um, you know, do, once once you've lasted a certain amount of time, are you safer? Is that does that, you know, kind of once once you've established that, does anybody want to you know, speak to that? Yeah, Professor Rob. So the Romanovs celebrate their 300th jubil jubilee in 1913. I mean, they've been around for 300 years, and that's a pretty long time. Four years later, there were no Romanovs, so I don't know how. Uh, how the longevity longevity works, but I mean, some of these some of these um, reign, some of these well dynasties last a very long time, and then part, another part of it is change is natural. I mean, change is absolutely natural, and so you, you wouldn't expect the Romanovs to last five hundred years. So, um, yes, yes, fair point. Uh, uh, right, and sometimes it could be a liability, right? Like you haven't kept up with the times, or like God, we're sick of you, right? We've been seeing we've been seeing you long enough. Uh, Professor Perrin. Yeah, I mean, my, my first instinct was to say, obviously not, um, because even very long-lived <laughs> regimes do fall. But at the same time, I think it does. Um, 
and again, I'll hark back to the example of the Carolingians. There had, the Carolingians had launched a coup 100 years earlier to try to take power, and it had been unsuccessful. Um, and I do think that there is something to be said for, again, people, generations and generations of people having known, no, known none other system than the one that they're, that they're in, and being then unable to really conceive of something that is revolutionary uh, and different. And I mean, one of the things that has struck me about the insurrection uh, last week and generally about the alt-right is how it is, I mean, it, for as horrific and awful and subversive and destructive as it is, it still speaks in this kind of language of, con of American constitutionalism. Like they, the, 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 the rioters claim that they wanted to get the election certified for Donald Trump so he could, he could serve for four more years. And like you've eroded the entire basis for that constitutional system. Uh, so why, why four more years? Why not 20 more years? Why not forever? I mean, if like, the, the, but, but they're still conceiving of things in terms of this, President served for four years. We have this process, um, so it 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 you know it is it is undermining all of the underpinnings of our democracy at the same time that it isn't really conceiving of something that is radically different from that that system. And I think that 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 pull of the uh, of, of 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 the tradition of the of the custom is is really important. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Uh, Professor McDonald, did you want to speak to that? Yeah, just quickly, you know, it reminds me of of the lyric from many of our uh, favorite musicals, Oceans Rise, Empires Fall, right? I, and, you know, there, there's been a lot of discussion before uh, this president about where America is in its historical trajectory. Um, you know, is this the Edward Gibbon moment we're in right now? Um, you know, it, it is, I think it's a really interesting question. And um, has this sped up the, uh, the decline of the American empire in a process that was, um, you know, had already been going on? I, again, these are questions that are going to take some time uh, to sort out. Um, but, you know, it, as Sean has said, and many of us have said, this is, this is indeed, I think, a, a fraught moment in the history of, of the United States we're in. Um, so, uh, the, the next question is, um, in the context of modern day America, could assassination play any part in an illegal seizure of power? The chain of command seems clear in our government. So I don't know if somebody wants to speak to that issue of the role assassination might play. Oh, sorry, Professor Rahm. I just, uh, again, a Russian parallel to, you know, just to bring up Russia, because I know it doesn't necessarily um, link with the United States, but what they did in the late 19th and early 20th century is that the, the actual revolutionaries, terrorists, if you want to call them from the government's perspective, they did assassination campaigns. So the idea wasn't to upset succession. So so much as to basically sort of destabilize the government. And they just went out and they picked on governors and whatnot and they assassinated high level authorities just to destabilize the government without, wasn't really a succession issue. Yeah, that's right. You know, your 19th century Europe, there was a very popular idea um, to, you know, kind of, you could do these, these hits on specific, there were lots of assassination attempts actually against Queen Victoria, even though she was also very popular, but that she seemed like a really good prominent prominent target. Um, yeah, Professor McDonald. Uh, yeah, that, uh, the question reminds me uh, a few years ago, the uh, the student um, theater, the Delray Players did a really great presentation of assassins uh, on campus here. And um, I was part of the panel that did the talk back afterwards. So uh, there was a, there were some interesting questions that day. I think it was 2017. Um, you know, I think in, in the in the US case, it would there is a clear line of succession. It would have to be, you know, it would have to be more than one assassination attempt. It would have to be like a true military coup, I think, where the military would be involved and take out um, that line of succession. And, and what is, again, terrifying about what happened last week, almost everybody in that line of succession was in the Capitol building. 
uh, that day, including the vice president, um, whose life was clearly threatened, um, as well as the Speaker of the House, who, who would have been next in line. So uh, it, you know, that thought did cross my mind, uh, has crossed my mind the past week. But there is, there is a clear line of succession um, in, in the US. It would have to be something much more dramatic um, and, and violent, um, not just a single um, assassination. And there would have to be, probably, I would guess, the military would be involved to, to break up that line of succession. Uh, and support whoever um, the assassins were. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, Professor Roth. Sorry to speak again, but just very quickly, like if you think of Lenin taking power in October of 1917, they take power. They also get hold of the Romanov family, Nicholas II, his wife, and all the kids. And it's interesting because they didn't assassinate Nicholas II because the Bolsheviks were already in power and Nicholas had abdicated. So it doesn't count as an assassination so much as a murder. They murdered the entire family, but just sort of in terms of like when the political system changes, we use a different word, whether it's assassination or murder or something like that. So that's really interesting. And obviously examples in the English Civil War and the French Civil War in terms of uh, having won and then um, uh, uh, declaring the king, uh, Charles I or, or um, uh, Louis the Sixteenth, um, a traitor, or uh, it, against the revolutionary regime, and so ordering them uh, um, to to be executed and carrying carrying those executions out. Um, I know that Professor Drummond, I believe, has to leave to go teach, which is obviously the only reason that we would let her go. Um, but it is important. Um, do you have to go right now? You do have to go right now, don't you? Well, I have to go in like a minute or two because my question. Okay. Well, I did. There's been a question waiting that I just thought you would probably be a good person to speak to. So I just wanted to get to this before you you went. This is how does the distinction between power and authority come into play in the era of Trumpism and other historical instances? And I, given what you had said about Weimar, I didn't know if you wanted to to touch on that before you leave. Um. Yeah, well, I'm I, I'm I'm not really sure what what distinction what 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 the person asking the question is trying to get at with the distinction what distinction they're trying to draw. Um, what I would say is that um, obviously in in Weimar, um, the fact that you had insiders and outsiders and different groups had different tended to align with different ideologically in different ways was important, right? So that even though you had um, a, a, a sort of social democratic party that had um, come to define uh, and create the Weimar Republic, you still had sources of both authority um, and power. And I'm talking of, of authority here in terms of respect from the population. Um, that were hostile to that government. And, and that certainly um, helped to undermine it. Um, and I thought you were gonna let me answer the memes joke because I would, or oh. the question about memes, because yes. I, um, I would say that I don't think irreverent jokes or memes um, are themselves dangerous. I think what's eroded respect for the government's power is consistent attempts by certain parties to actively dismantle the government, um, handicap it, and to really undermine it. They're not doing it through memes, they're doing it through actions. Um, uh, and I think by that delegitimization of the government, that's what makes the attack on the Capitol easier, not just um, funny jokes. Um, yeah. But now I do have thank to you. Thank you for getting that one in too. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Great. Thank you so much, Professor Drummond. Have a good class. Um, yes, Professor McDonald. Yeah, the, uh, that's. I wanted to address the the meme question, and not about the memes, but the. Um, we we want to consider how uh, the president came his rise to political power was was through the um, the racist attack on Obama right about um, birtherism and that's that's how he got his political rise uh, to to perpetrate that Obama wasn't a citizen that he was born somewhere else um, and that certainly has had an effect in in delegitimizing or, or in certain quarters and and let's be let's be clear, it's only one party that has done this. And, you know, where, where maybe a few years ago, 
uh, these ideas and conspiracies were on the fringe, they're now a major part of one party in this country. And it's the party that holds power for the next few days and uh, a party that refused with a few exceptions um, to, to agree to impeach a president who clearly incited a riot an insurrection in the Capitol. And so the party is still beholden to these conspiracy theories, um, which again, at one point a few years ago may have been on the fringe, but is now much more closer to the center of the uh, Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, Professor Perrin. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to the question about um, irreverent memes um, because I think it's a really it's a really interesting one and a really important point. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think satire is always one of the important tools of political resistance um, and needs to be uh, protected. But I think also we're in this dangerous moment where people are not understanding where humor and satire ends and actual news and facts begins. And I think I'm thinking of like the I think it was in with respect to Tucker Carlson where Fox News basically claims that, well, nobody really believes that anyway. It's so outlandish, but obviously it is news. I mean, it is news to a great many people. Um, and so that seems to me to be what's dangerous and what, what, what does undermine um, trust in the government, does undermine respect for, uh, uh, for, for, for our system. Uh, yeah, uh, definitely. Um, uh, historian Timothy Snyder, not our own LMU's Timothy Snyder, but the historian Timothy Snyder has uh, been very eloquent um, and persuasive about thinking of this as the big lie of the stolen election um, and, and the way that that has gotten perpetrated. Um, I don't see any further questions. Um, and we are at 150. So I and I just wanted to ask our panelists if you have any kind of further things you wanted to say. If you have questions you wanted to ask your uh, um, fellow panelists, um, but otherwise I um, I wanted to kind of wrap things up here. But uh, any last thoughts from uh, any of our any of our panelists? All right, fantastic. I am going to put in the Q and A, uh, sorry, not in the Q and A, in the chat, one last time, the uh, link to the history department. I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, we will have more events coming up. So uh, keep your eyes peeled for those um, as uh, the, the semester continues. Um, I hope everyone stays safe. You can always reach out to myself or I'm sure any of the panelists or of course the chair, uh, Professor Elizabeth Drummond. Thank you so much for coming. And um, we look forward to having you attend future events by the History Department. So thanks so much, everyone.